regulatory technical difficulties. Yes. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to our guest lecture series. Um, so for today, we have Dr. Kieran McRae. He's a lecturer of modern and contemporary uh, Korean history in the Faculty of Liberal Education in Seoul National University. So he received his master's degree in Korean studies and PhD in international studies from the Graduate School of International Studies in Seoul National University. His dissertation focuses on post-Cold War history wars in South Korea. He's Canadian by birth and he has called Korea his home for the better part of two decades now. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Dr. Kieran McRae. Sorry, wrong button there. <clears throat> Thank you, Harvin, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. So as Harvin mentioned, my name is Kieran McRae, um, and I'm going to be giving a lecture today uh, the first of two parts on um, uh, the Korean, the South Korean miracle. So today we're going to be talking about democratization. Um, so I'm going to share my screen in a second. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you to all, all the people who have made this event possible. I know there was a lot of coordination uh, going on behind the scenes here. Um, so without further ado, just going to share my screen here. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Oh, you know what, though? I just want to give me a second here. Yeah, I just want to bring up the the group chat because uh, as we go along, I'll probably be typing some things in the group chat just if I want to, um, you know, if I mention some names or, or dates or something like that. Okay, shall we get started? So today uh, uh, is... Uh, sorry, just in case uh, we are watching your... Um, your no, it's not the presentation mode, but... The the one that you okay you have your, thank you your, your notes yes thank you for letting me know yeah sometimes that happens I think I could fix this by swapping displays does that fix it yes yeah perfect okay okay thank you for letting me know okay so um yes yeah, so today is part one of two lectures uh, today we're going to be focusing on what I call democratization okay so basically we're going to be having a kind of uh, political history today, and then next week we'll be focusing on the kind of economic history or economic development of South Korea, um, and that way we're hopefully going to come to a little better understanding of the South Korean miracle. Okay, so um, here's a bit of an overview of of what I'm going to talk about today. My lecture today divided into three parts. Um, so first, I'm just gonna provide an introduction. Um, I want to give a little bit of background about South Korea. I'll be focusing on the, on the years um, 1953 to 1987, but I'll give a little bit of background, um, offer kind of a main question to frame uh, the discussion, and then, um, yeah, basically that's it. B background, main question, and present a kind of framework for today's discussion. Okay, so next we'll be looking at the uh, kind of main part of the lecture, the kind of details, right? The kind of information, political history of South Korea from 1953 to 1987, focusing on this um, process of becoming a democracy, right? A de democratization. And then finally, in the final part, in the last part, I'll present a way, a couple ways of trying to make sense of why, trying to explain why South Korea um, went through this process, why South Korea is a democracy today. So this is the kind of interpretive part of the lecture. Okay, so part one, introduction. 
Okay, so a little bit of background, right? Uh, um, so as I mentioned today, I'll be starting in uh, uh, focusing on the period between 1953 to 1987. A couple things uh, that I would uh, kind of emphasize to keep in mind as background here. First of all, I think the most important thing to know is that um, Korea was a colony of Japan between 1910 and 1945. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with that. I would just want to emphasize, right? It's it's a very important um, part of the kind of uh, background, the history before um, 1953, right? It was a a, uh, a colony of Japan, and um, that has been a source, a continuing source of conflict in South Korean society, right? The the fact of why South Korea or why Korea became a colony of Japan, and the kind of um, um, also the the kind of conflict between Koreans as well over the colonial period, right? What people did during the colonial period, whether they sort of benefited from the Japanese rule, whether they resisted Japanese rule. It's a very important legacy in understanding uh, Korean society and Korean history. Next, the second point I would emphasize is um, the division, right? So we have two Koreas today. We have a North Korea, we have a South Korea. Um, so the, uh, the kind of long and short of it, right. Cause just very briefly, the, the Koreas were divided in 1945 by the Soviets, the Soviet union and the United States, um, to handle the, uh, retreat or, or the, sorry, the surrender of the Japanese at the end of world war II. And this two occupations, uh, solidified. Over the following three years, as the Cold War uh, began to take shape uh, and eventually uh, resulted in the establishment of two separate states in 1948, right? You get the North Korean state and the South Korean state. And the uh, the only way forward from there, the, the two states went to war in 1950 um, to try and settle this problem, right, of two states. They wanted one Korea, one state, right? So they went to war for three years and ended up basically where they started, okay? In a kind of stalemate. They drew in the United States into this war. They drew in China, communist China into this war. Um, was a very uh, destructive conflict, but in the end, basically settled around uh, the same kind of border, two states, okay? So, this is uh, this is kind of where our story begins, right? 1953. We've been through this um, colonial period. We've been through this process of division. We've been through the Korean War, and now we kind of have these two states trying to pick up the pieces. And so this is what's kind of interesting about the South Korean story here, right? Because after 1953, um, well, if we look at the two Koreas today, right, it seems like they have gone through a very dramatic divergence since 1953, right? So some would describe it basically North Korea as kind of, um, has not had the same kind of success as South Korea, right? We're talking about a South Korean miracle today, not necessarily a North Korean miracle, right? Some would paint this as kind of history of failure, history of success, right? So what we're gonna be doing is kind of examining this uh, this narrative of South Korea as a kind of history of success, right? Uh, especially compared to its North Korean counterpart. Okay, so we begin with our main question. Why is South Korea a democracy? Okay, this might seem like a bit of a, a strange question. Um, really what I'm getting at with this question is I want to kind of um, imply that it's, that it's not really inevitable, okay, that South Korea is a democracy today. There was a, um, a lot of contingencies, a lot of... Um, things happen along the way, right? That kind of lead to this. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna be uh, examining today, okay? And trying to figure out how how we ended up here, right? And to sort of frame this discussion, I, I want to show you a, a video clip here. This is a video clip um, posted on YouTube by the National Museum of Contemporary History. Okay, it's a museum located in Seoul, in the in the Gwanghamun Plaza. If you've ever been to Seoul, it's kind of like the main area in Seoul. 
And it's really great. It's meant to be a kind of educational video for basically for foreigners, right? For it's, it's all in English, trying to kind of teach the world about this question, trying to explain to people why is South Korea democracy today? It's very it's, it's about five minutes long and it kind of succinctly tries to explain this. OK, so I'd like to uh, use this video as a starting point for our discussion. Um, I'm not exactly sure if the sound is going to work for you here, okay? But I'm going to try it, and hopefully it'll work. C can you guys hear the sound of the video? Uh, no, I, no, professor. There's, there's no sound for you. Uh, none. No. You're not getting any sound. No. Any no. sound. Okay, that's too bad. I guess this isn't going to work then. Um, what um, I'll do then, Professor, you can um access share settings. Then it's like oh, share. okay. If there's All a right, let me mark see. that should say you, you can share the audio. Okay, let me see. And then sharing notes. Mm. Not exactly sure how to do that. Maybe you can stop sharing, and when you share again, I'll stop share. share okay, I'll try that. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, so when I click on this, ah, share sound. I see it. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so that should. Okay. All right, so let me try this again. News Weekly. Yes. Oh, whoops. Now we hear it. Okay, great. The British Economic News Weekly. The Economist in its Democracy Index aside for Japan. Singled out the Republic of Korea as the only full democracy. 15th August 1945, Liberation. 10th May 1948, first election held with universal suffrage. 17th July 1948, the Constitutional Convention promulgates South Korea's constitution. 15th August 1948, a democratic government is established in South Korea. From then until now, Korea democracy, though with much tumult, has progressed. On 15th August 1948, the first democratic republic in Korean history was established. A democratic system that guaranteed representative institutions, the separation of powers, universal suffrage, freedom of the press, protest and association was introduced. Much power was vested in the president, but the National Assembly had the right to select them. Sung Man Rhee, the first president, introduced direct presidential elections in order to maintain his grip on power. He also had the constitution amended to remove term limits, thus amending the constitution twice. But in the midst of such authoritarian tendencies, competitive party politics, elections and expressions of the popular will and education in the value of democracy all became manifest. Rhee's government collapsed as a result of the 19th April Revolution set off by electoral rigging in the 1960 presidential election. Following the 19th April Revolution, the Democratic Party took power and a constitutional reform that created a parliamentary system was put into effect. However, the demands of the people long since suppressed burst forth, creating social turmoil. A group of officers led by Park Chung-hee seized power in a military coup. The Park Chung-hee military government began economic development while transforming itself into a civilian government through elections. 
Economic progress ensured Park's easy re-election, but he introduced constitutional amendment to enable him to run for a third term before becoming president for life under the Yushin system in response to a security crisis. Those openly critical of the new system, some students, religious individuals and intellectuals were dealt with severely. However, amid rapid economic growth, the people began increasingly aware of the rights and obligations of the citizens. In the 1978 National Assembly elections, the opposition received more votes than the ruling party. These results gave rise to an upswing in anti yushin activities, and the system collapsed from within as the ruling clique disagreed on how to deal with growing protests. Hardliners led by Chun Du Huan initiated another coup, extending military dictatorship and restricting the freedoms and rights of the people. With continued rapid economic growth, however, a middle class of highly educated technical staff, technicians and white collar workers emerged, creating a growing social base for democracy. The movement for democracy among students, politicians, and intellectuals became more active. In June 1987, the popular movement for the introduction of direct presidential elections reached a climax, with the ruling clique assenting to popular demands. Since then, the Republic of Korea has taken the path of peaceful democratization. From 1987 onward, following constitutional reform, a president has been peacefully elected every given five years. While the opposition and ruling parties have swapped power twice. And so, procedural democracy has been consolidated in the Republic of Korea. Following the introduction of constitutional democratic institutions in 1948, though with much trial and error, over many years, Korean democracy has grown and matured. Now, what is left is to consolidate still further, building a stronger, fairer politics. Okay, so I think we have a pretty clear explanation here of why South Korea is a democracy, okay? This isn't just a kind of, um, it isn't just kind of conveying information about, you know, these events. It's kind of organizing them in a narrative, okay? So I would um, especially emphasize toward the end of this clip the following sentence here, okay? Following the introduction of constitutional democratic institutions in 1948, though with much trial and error, over many years, Korean democracy has grown and matured, okay? So, we, so two points about this. One, there's a very strong emphasis on the fact that South Korea was kind of founded as a constitutional uh, liberal democracy in 1948. Okay, so this idea that there's something about the way South Korea was founded from the start, okay, has a lot to do with why it's a democracy today, okay? And the other point I would emphasize here is that it was basically a, a process of growing, okay? So kind of like a plant. I have the plant here in the background, right? A plant kind of growing, maturing. It's a kind of gradual process, okay? So, um, this is kind of interesting because it's a, a kind of semi kind of official narrative, right, a, a presented by this Museum of Contemporary History. And it gives us a kind of starting point here, okay, because we can kind of think about whether or not this explanation is persuasive, okay, um, as we go through our, um, our, the details of South Korean democratization. And what I really want to do here is rather than kind of presenting a different definitive answer to this question is kind of engage with how scholars kind of differ in explaining this event and how it's uh, also kind of controversial in public memory, okay? So different ways of, of the public also thinking about how to explain this, okay? Okay, so now we're going to get into the details, okay? What happened between 1953 and 1987? Okay, so we'll start with the Syngman Rhee era. Uh, so Syngman Rhee was the first president of South Korea. He 
um, was president from 1948 to 1960, right? So right from its founding. Sigmund Rhee is, is a bit of an interesting character. If you ever have a chance, he has a very interesting life. He was born in 1875. Um, so he lived through, you know, this kind of late 19th century, uh, great power rivalries, lived through the colonial period, and then finally becomes president only when he's 73 years old. Okay, so he lived a long life even before he became the first president. Um, he spent much of the colonial period in the United States. Okay, so he was very close with the Americans. That's part of why he became the first president. He was able to speak fluently in English. Here he is pictured with his wife, Francesca Rhee. So she was actually Austrian. His, he, the first president of South Korea actually had a foreign wife. It's kind of an interesting fact here, right? Uh, very importantly, he was very strongly anti-communist. Okay, so I think that's probably one of the most important characteristics. So in, in the one hand, he was kind of close with the Americans, had this kind of um, belief in liberal democracy, but he was also very strongly anti-communist, okay, which is going to be important. So this is the point I would try to emphasize here about this, this idea that South Korea was founded as a, as, a, as a liberal democracy, right, which is supposed to be very important for why it is a democracy today. But there was also this very important tension at, at the founding of the South Korean uh, government. This was a tension between liberal democracy, this kind of principle on the one hand, and anti-communism on the other, right? So don't forget that South Korea was founded in opposition to North Korea, which is a communist state. They fought this war over who kind of had a right to kind of um, uh, be sovereign over the Korean Peninsula, right? So anti-communism was also very strong in, in, in the South Korean state, very kind of strong governing principle, okay? So on the one hand, you had elections in South Korea, right? People voting for presidents, they're kind of expressing the popular will to a certain degree. You also had limited pluralism, okay? So you had um, uh, kind of uh, freedom of speech to a certain degree, you had a, a media, you had um, multiple political parties competing with each other for elections. So this is uh, very different, for example, with Taiwan. Okay, so there's a lot of actually similarities between the, the histories of Taiwan and South Korea during this period. But Taiwan, for example, the nationalist parties, when they lost the civil war with China, they came over to Taiwan and they established martial law, and a one-party system, okay? Up until about, I think it was 1988, um, they had a one-party system in Taiwan, okay? It's very different from South Korea. So South Korea did have this kind of limited pluralism, okay, to a certain extent. This principle of, of, of liberal democracy was an operation. But on the other hand, anti-communism was very important. So the probably the most important um, institution we can mention here is the National security law. Okay. I lost my chatting. You show tap. Okay, so let's just let me type that. The national security law. It's also known as the NSL. Okay. So the national security law enabled the president to kind of uh, arrest, detain, even torture, even put to death, okay, people who were considered to be communists, okay? So in that sense, your kind of rights under a liberal democracy only extended to as far as you weren't communist, right? So there was this way in which anti-communism kind of superseded liberal democracy, right? Yes, we're a liberal democracy as long as we kind of keep out any of these kind of communist elements, right? So there's a way in which the, the national security law was kind of above the, the constitution. It was the kind of ultimate principle, right? Um, and this, in this context, right, this context in which national security, anti-communism was kind of um, at the foreground, right? Um, also gave the president great power. Right. Um, and we see this 
through uh, another characteristic of this Lee period, this Re period, constitutional amendments. Okay, so um, two examples in the 1950s. Uh, first of all, um, Syngman Re amended the constitution to have popular election of the president. As was mentioned in the video, he did it not because you know he wanted to develop democracy necessarily, but because he um, didn't think he would get reelected if it was just the National Assembly electing him. And another one in May 1954 to extend the term limits, okay? So in this sense, you can see that, yes, we have this uh, constitution of liberal democracy, but we also have anti-communism as kind of above the more supreme principle. And we also see that the president was kind of willing to change the constitution when it didn't suit him, right? For, uh, to kind of pursue his own interests. This is gonna be, these are gonna be themes going forward through um, South Korean history. Okay, so the April Revolution. Uh, Syngman Rhee is deposed in April 1960. Okay, this is the end of the Syngman Rhee. He's deposed through a kind of popular uprising. So what happens is basically in March 1960, there's um, uh, uncovering some evidence of vote rigging in the uh, vice presidential election around this time, leads to demonstrations in a town in the south, a city in the south called Masan. And the next month in April, uh, a body washes up on shore. It's the body of a young student. Okay, and it turns out that he's been um, hit by a tear gas canister and it looks like the police have tried to hide the body, get rid of the evidence. So this causes, this causes a kind of eruption okay, of, of protest against the re-governed. People are angry, already angry about the vote rigging, but now they've discovered this body of the student. So now the, the, the demonstration spread to Seoul, okay? Um, and the police respond very viciously by attacking the students in Seoul, okay? This galvanizes them even for, further. So on April 19th, okay? This is the kind of culmination of the April Revolution. In Korean, it's known as the April 19 Revolution, okay? Um, April 19th, 30,000 students march on the presidential re residence, okay? The police are ordered to fire into the students, and um, reportedly about 130 students are killed, okay? And a thousand more injured. So, this kind of escalate, escalates the conflict, okay? So it's kind of getting uh, bigger and bigger. There's um, some uh, indecision about how to resolve this situation. And basically what happens is the army turns on Rhee, basically. It decides that we're not going to side with Rhee anymore and kind of putting down these demonstrations. It's getting too violent. Rhee's getting old. By now, he's, he's in his 80s, okay? So the army decides they're not going to go along with the suppression of the demonstrations. And meanwhile, the United States also comes out, does a press conference, as a kind of um, um, suggests that it's time for Rhee to go, okay? So basically, Rhee loses the support of the military, he loses the support of the United States, and he decides to resign, okay? So on April 26th, he goes off to Hawaii. Okay, where he lives the rest of his life. So this is actually similar to what happened in Philippines in 1986, right? With Marcos um, basically losing the support of the United States and going off to live in Hawaii, right? In the face of these um, massive demonstrations. So, with the April Revolution, we have a kind of new chapter in South Korean history, right? This, this period under Ri is, is generally regarded as kind of corrupt, right? We've had these constitutional reforms. We've had these arrests of political opponents in the name of anti-communism. So now it's a chance for hopefully a kind of democratic opening, right? A little more, um, uh, a little more implementation of this principle of liberal democracy in the constitution, right? So the opposition, gets a chance to take power uh, through this April Revolution. We call this kind of democratic interlude. Here in the picture here, I have uh, Jang Myon on the left. On the right is Yun Bo-san. Okay, Jang Myon will be the new prime minister 
in this system, okay? They get rid of the presidential system, they put in a prime minister. This kind of speaks, however, to the kind of priorities that the Democratic Party had at the time, okay? So on the one hand, we had these social demands, right? People wanted justice for Reed and his associates, okay? They wanted to see these guys punished for the kind of corruption that was going under the Reed regime. On the other hand, they're also calling for economic development, okay? So we'll be talking more about this next week, but through the 1950s, South Korea was extremely poor, okay? One of the poorest countries in the world at this time. And the, the war only made this worse, right? So they, they haven't been able to really recover from the war. There's a strong social demand for economic growth and justice, okay? But the opposition priority here is more to kind of reform the constitution. Again, they make a parliamentary system and that's, they see this kind of suited to um, pursuing their own power. Okay, if they get rid of the presidential system, their party will have a better chance of maintaining power. Okay. Meanwhile, the Democratic, the Democratic Party itself splits into factions. Okay, so you have the, the Changmyeon faction on the left here. It's called the new faction, and then you have the Yumbo Sun faction here, the old faction. So they kind of taken power now, and they begin conflicting with each other, right? About who should be at taking the reins of power now, right? So this leads to a kind of basically ineffective government under the Changmyeon regime, right? There's a um, um, what is used, used typically described as a kind of chaos under the under the Chang government. They don't really get the things done that the people are calling for. The, this new government seems kind of just as corrupt as the old government. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you have people kind of calling for unification with the North. Okay, there's, there's students who decide to try and kind of go and meet with Kim Il-sung around this time, and just kind of negotiate unilaterally for unification. This makes the United States very nervous. It makes a lot of powerful people in South Korea very nervous. Okay, so there's there's a, a loss of confidence in the Chang, gov Chang government through this uh, this year as, with a democratic experiment. So basically through this, that this democratic interlude doesn't go very well. Okay, we've had this breakthrough through April 1960, and then we have this kind of disappointment with the de democracy. So. The democratic interlude comes to an end with the May 16 coup d'etat of Park Jung-hee, okay, in 1961. This is um, just over a year after the April Revolution, right? So this coup is quick. Uh, it happens in the more early morning of May 16th, 1961, basically within the space of a few hours. Uh, it's relatively bloodless, okay? There's not not much bloodshed takes place in this coup. The army is, the, the group is relatively easily able to kind of uh, seize power. So we'll talk about why in a second. Um, it's carried out by uh, about 3,600 troops. So kind of relatively small group within the military led by this guy here, right? This is Pak Jung-hee. So he's going to be the, the leader of South Korea for the next 18 years. Okay, 1961 to 1979, very important figure in understanding South Korean history, right? Still very important today. Okay, so why did this coup succeed? So we can think about it this way, right? We just had a year earlier, this kind of mass uprising, right? Over government corruption, over basically an authoritarian government, right? People demanding democracy. So in this sense, it's kind of interesting that the, the, the May 16th coup is able to kind of succeed relatively easily, right? Why is that? Well, for one thing, we see that the Chang government under Chang Myon, Prime Minister Chang Myon, basically kind of collapses, okay? It shows its weakness. So um, during this time, the United States, um, the on the ground in Korea, they were looking for a way to kind of um, coordinate with the Korean military to put down this coup d'etat, but they were having trouble finding Chang Myon. It turns out he had actually gone into hiding. When he heard about this coup, he went and hid 
He was Catholic. He went and hid in a Catholic monastery. Meanwhile, Yudinbosan, the next kind of highest up in the democratic government, um, expresses a kind of passivity, a passive attitude toward this coup. He's kind of, well, let's wait and see what happens. I, and, he, and he kind of gives an excuse. Well, I'm not the prime minister, so there's nothing I can do, right? So it's kind of speculation here. He was calculating. Well, maybe through this crew, crew, coup, I can kind of get rid of Changmian, and then we can take power, okay? Meanwhile, the United States government, um, after they see this initial kind of passivity of the democratic government, kind of adopts a kind of wait and see, okay? So they, they decide that they're just going to kind of step back and see what happens. So they're not actively preventing this coup d'etat. And then finally, as I mentioned, the people are relatively complacent. Okay, so they don't kind of rise up and demand, you know, a stop to this military coup. Okay, so this kind of, I think, shows there was a, a massive kind of disappointment in the Chang government. Okay, and there was disappointment with the kind of chaos that ensued during that period. So the people basically decide to kind of give Pak Tung a chance, okay? And I think one of the main reasons why here is because the coup, Pak Tung and these coup leaders justify, rationalize their coup as an extension of the April Revolution, okay? So they say that the Zhang government failed to kind of implement the demands of the April Revolution. We're here to ensure those demands are met. Okay, so that's the kind of rhetoric, that's the narrative um, they're bringing to the table about their coup. And I think this, this has a certain degree of traction in the public. Okay, so the people are, are willing to kind of give this new government a chance. They want to see justice for this, these corrupt government officials. They want to see economic development. Okay. So a little bit of background about Pak Tung Yi, just um, because he's so important for South Korean history. So uh, Pak Tung Yi was born in 1917. Okay, in in a, in a, a today it's a small city called Gumi, which is um, near Daegu in North Gyeongsang Province. Now this is a very important region because. After Pak Tung Yi seizes power in 1961, basically the kind of elites in South Korean society are going to be coming from this area until uh, at least you know 1987, and of course still very strong even into the post 1987 era. But this kind of region, this North Gyeongsang region, now is going to dominate South Korean politics from 1961 on. So he's born in 1917. This is important because he's born during the colonial period, right? He's never known an independent Korea, okay? He grows up in a colonized Korea. He has an elite education, okay? So he goes to um, good schools. Um, he eventually becomes a teacher, which is actually a very privileged job for Koreans during the colonial period, okay? So he's, he's actually um, advanced himself quite a lot. But what happens is... 1939, the Japanese are having trouble with their war in China. They decide to open their ranks to Korean volunteers in their army, okay? And Pak Tung Yi kind of jumps at this chance, right? He decides, I want to be a soldier. He joins up the Japanese army. Quite famously or infamously at this time, um, he's too old to get into the military academy. So what he does, he decides he's going to write a letter to the emperor, kind of um, 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 swearing his loyalty. Okay, so if he thinks if he kind of shows this enthusiasm for getting to the academy, he'll be able to do it. He writes this letter in blood, swearing loyalty to the emperor, okay? And the Japanese authorities are actually quite impressed by this letter. They decide to put it in the newspaper and kind of show the people, like, these are the kind of Korean soldiers we need for our war effort in China, okay? So he actually gets into the academy. Uh, he becomes one of the top students at the academy, and eventually becomes a soldier in the Japanese army, okay? So this is part of why Pak Chung-hee is so controversial in Korea today, 
Okay, so it's not just that he was a kind of authoritarian leader, right? Um, it's also because he has this background as a Japanese soldier. Okay, so for some people, he's just a collaborator. Okay, and that's basically the, the defining characteristic of Pak Chung-hee. On the other hand, as we'll see next week, right, he also had the period of the kind of economic takeoff, right? So under Pak Chung-hee, the Korean economy also takes off, right? So for some people, he's a hero in South Korea too, right? It's a very controversial legacy. Okay, so Pak Chung-hee takes power in 1961. What is his first priority, right? Remember that the, the Jiang government, their first priority was basically kind of reforming the constitution. Pak Chung-hee also reforms the constitution back to a presidential system, concentrates power in himself, okay? But I would say more than that, the kind of main priority that defines Pak Chung-hee's um, uh, early tenure as president is his, his pursuit of normalizing relations with Japan. This is the main priority of Pak Chung-hee from the start, okay? So this is important. Basically, we, we heard, remember, that South Korea was a colony of Japan from 1910 to 1945. But after decolonization, the two countries had failed to kind of reconnect in terms of diplomatic relations. Okay, so South Korea wasn't officially recognized by Japan as a country. And this was a problem. The United States also wanted Japan and South Korea to kind of reconcile. And hopefully they, were, they wanted Japan to kind of take up some of the load in helping to rebuild South Korea after the Korean War. Pak Chung-hee was very enthusiastic about this, okay? So he had been a Japanese soldier. He, was, uh, he thought that he could work with Japan to develop the economy, okay? So J Japan, um, Japan actually becomes, incidentally, his first foreign destination as the new, um, not yet president, but the kind of leader of South Korea. So the first country he visits is Japan, right? He goes there to kind of test the waters, kind of show his enthusiasm about moving forward with normalizing relations. Um, um, here in this picture here, you can see he's, uh, this is him in Japan, kind of talking with these Japanese diplomats, very comfortable in this atmosphere. He speaks fluent Japanese, feels in a way himself kind of, you know, um, imbued with a Japanese culture. He's actually speaking here with Kishi Nobosuke. Some of you may rep recognize that name. Some of you may not. So Kishi Nobosuke would be a uh, prime minister. Um, he was prime minister in the late 1950s in Japan. But more importantly, he was one of these kind of top level officials in Manchuria during the time that Pak chung -hee was a soldier there, okay? So Pak chung -hee had kind of seen the, the kind of development in Manchuria under top-level officials like Kishi. Um, they shared a kind of ideology, let's say kind of developmentalist ideology. And Kishi Nobusuke is also the grandfather of Abe Shinzo, right? The recent prime minister of Japan who was assassinated a few years ago he was the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history, incidental. Okay, so uh, Japan is the priority for Pak chung -hee, okay? <clears throat> but this is controversial, okay? People are very nervous in South Korea about kind of reconnecting with Japan. They're more than anything worried they're going to get a bad deal, and they're worried they're going to. Uh, get into a similar situation that they were in between 1910 and 1945, some kind of economic subservience, okay? They're gonna be basically serving the needs of the Japanese economy. Um, so this creates a lot of controversy, um, especially when it comes out um, that the Kim Jong-pil, this is Pak Chung-hee's right-hand man, has been carrying out secret meetings in Japan to discuss normalization, okay? So they're worried, they want, people in Korea want to know why Pak chung is not only pursuing normalization with Japan, but doing it in a kind of secret way, right? Is he trying to pursue some kind of treaty or some kind of agreement 
that will kind of sell out the country. That's the kind of concern here, okay? So what we're seeing here basically is Park chung has this kind of initial mandate, right? He's, he's carrying forth the principles of the April Revolution, but it's starting to dissolve now as he's pursuing this normalization with Japan, okay? And so in um, January 1963, so this is um, just under two years after Park chung coup d'etat, we start to get these massive demonstrations against Park chung already. Okay, we get the alliance between the opposition party. By the way, here's here's Yumbo Sun again, right? So Yumbo Sun now has emerged as a kind of main opposition candidate. So you get the alliance between the opposition, the students, and the intellect intellectuals. Okay, so for example, here is Ham Sok Khan. Ham Sok Khan is one of these kind of founding figures of the this. A journal called Sasange in South Korea, one of the most important um, intellectual journals around this time. So you have these kind of prominent intellectuals, the opposition, the students, they're all turning on Park chung over this issue of um, normalization with Japan. Park chung is kind of losing control. And then very dramatically, in uh, on May 20th, uh, 1964, <coughs> As these kind of you know demonstrations have been going on, kind of culminates in what we call the funeral for national democracy. Okay, so this is actually carried out by students at Seoul National University. It's a kind of satire or kind of um, yeah, kind of uh, sardonic, sardonic way of criticizing the Park chung regime. Basically, this is the idea of national democracy was the kind of principle of the April Revolution, implementing a democracy that pursues economic development and kind of independence. So basically the students are coming out and declaring here, Park chung you've abandoned the April Revolution. Okay, we no longer have any support for you. Okay, so any, any kind of this initial support Park chung has had now is, is beginning to dissolve. Okay, through this normalization. This culminates in the June uprising, okay, these intense clashes between the students and the military. Park chung kind of comes to a crossroads, you know, what to do? Am I going to be brought down like um, Isengman over this, okay? But ultimately, he maintains the support of the military, the support of the United States. I think that there's a lot of support behind the scenes for his <clears throat> economic policies, okay? He implements martial law, and he's able to overcome these demonstrations, okay? He pushes through this initial challenge to his uh, regime, and then finally he's able to sign the Normalization Treaty on June 22nd, 1965. So this is the kind of initial push of the uh, Park chung regime, and as we'll see <clears throat> next week, this is around the time that the, the uh, South Korean economy begins to take off, okay? So it turns out this normalization with Japan turns out to be very beneficial for the South Korean economy, okay? Connecting with the Japanese economy, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be getting into some crises. Uh, before we do, Harbin, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, is there any kind of policy about the breaks here, about breaking this up? You can call for a break, sir, like a 10-minute break. Should we do 10 minutes now? Yes, that's no problem. Is it, is it one 10 minute break? No, it, it, um, what usually we, we do in a three hour class is just, yeah, one 10 minute break. But if you want to have further, that's okay also. No, no, no. Okay, so we'll keep going then and we'll take, we'll take a 10 minute break about halfway through then. Does yes, that sound okay? That's, yeah, All that's right. okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so Pak Togi, after 1965, the economy begins to grow. And he begins to gather again a little bit of support. Okay, so people are seeing now, well, at least the economy is growing. Okay, that's part of the promise of the April Revolution. Okay, so he may have signed this treaty with Japan. He may have um, made a lot of people suspicious, made a lot of people nervous. But the economy is beginning to grow. In 1967, he's re-elected as president, okay, to his second term. Fairly 
let's say, easily compared to his first election. So this is uh, he's basically showing that he's, he's gathering public support now through this economic development. I think that shows the degree to which people were very um, desiring of economic development, even with all this kind of suspicion about Pak Chung-hee. The economy is growing. Okay, we'll give Pak Chung-hee another chance. Okay, so he gets elected to a second term. However, the again, this kind of legitimacy, this mandate that he has out of this economic growth is very quickly um, squandered, very quickly begins to dissolve. Okay, so what happens is uh, Pak Chung-hee government begins to experience a series of crises. Okay, so. Let me go through these here. First, we have a political crisis, okay? So, uh, as soon as Pak chung -hee is re-elected to president in 1967, he also has a majority in the National Assembly, his party. His first priority now is to reform the Constitution, okay? Just like Re did, just like the Democratic Party did, just like he did when he first did the uh, did the coup d'état, he needs to reform the constitution again. This time, he needs to extend the term limits. Okay, so in the constitution at this time, presidents are limited to two terms of four years. Okay, he wants to pursue a third term. Okay, so he decides to change the constitution to allow presidents to do three terms. Again, this this meets with a very forceful reaction from. Uh, civil society. Okay, so yes, he's brought economic growth, but now there's a there's kind of a demand that you've you've kind of you've done the initial work here, you've you've helped the economy to grow, but it's time to step aside. Okay, we need other leaders to kind of move this forward now. Okay, we don't want one man one man long term rule, just like there was under Re, because that kind of leads to corruption. Right, that that's the worry here. So this gets a very intense reaction from civil society, opposition to the reform in the constitution for uh, a third term. Okay, so in this in Korea, and this is known as the Samsung Gehan, is uh, reforming the constitution to allow the president to run for a third term. So he's able to do this. He's able to pass the resolution, right? Beca because he has this majority in the National Assembly. So politically, there's no problem here, but he does get this kind of massive reaction from civil society. And in 1971, when he runs for his third term, his victory, he wins, but it's very, very narrow, okay? Um, there's even some speculation here that, again, there's some kind of voter fraud or corruption going on here. He wins the election. It's very narrow. Uh, some of you may recognize in this picture, uh, we have the emergence of a very um, charismatic opposition figure in these elections, much more charismatic than Yoon Bo Sun, Kim Dae-jung. So eventually, Kim Dae-jung will actually become president, not until 1997, but for now, he's kind of this charismatic opposition figure, um, presents this very um, important challenge to Pak Chung-hee. So Pak chung is beginning to feel pressure from the opposition party. Meanwhile, his, his, his own party loses the majority in the National Assembly, okay? So he no longer has the power to change the constitution so that he can, you know, extend his rule, okay? So he's having this kind of political crisis now. His, his <clears throat> His term as president looks like it's going to come to an end, at least at the end of this term, okay? Next, we have a security crisis, okay? If you uh, were paying attention in, in the video, this was emphasized uh, as the kind of uh, source of what will eventually become a more intense period of authoritarian government, right? They're saying Pak chung was responding to a security crisis. So I'm going to divide the security crisis into two parts. On the one hand, there's a kind of security crisis on the Korean Peninsula. And then on the other hand, there's also a kind of security crisis in terms of South Korea, United States relations at this time. So let's talk about the security crisis um, internally at the time on the Korean Peninsula. Okay. So in the background, 
Uh, South Korea has been sending troops to Vietnam since 1965. Okay, South Korea is fighting in the Vietnam War. That's something we're going to discuss more next week. Okay, when we're talking about South Korea's economic development. But for now, it's important to note they've been sending the troops to Vietnam. North Korea is feeling a bit of pressure to kind of help its communist, um, um, I say, comrade in, in Vietnam, right? It's uh, North, Northern Vietnam and the uh, Viet Cong in the South. So the South Koreans are sending their soldiers. What can North Korea do, right, to kind of contribute to this? So they're also trying to put pressure on South Korea, okay? Between 1965 uh, and, and roughly around 1968, 1969, sometimes referred to as a period of the Second Korean War, okay? This is a period of intense cl border clashes between North and South Korea, okay? So there's, for example, there's a lot of talk today about the kind of tension between North and South, which is, of course, very serious, right? But we can also compare it to this period in terms of just, like, um, actual kind of fighting going on, casualties, deaths. There's really actually no comparison. This is the most intense period of fighting between South and North Korea other than the Korean War. Okay, so this is why it's sometimes called the Second Korean War. So, for example, in 1967, this is the kind of height of this, these classes, there are more than 400 clashes at the DMZ. That's more than one a day. Can you imagine if that was going on today? Like, how crazy that would be on the news? Like, there were actual clashes going on at the border, more than one a day, people dying. So, it's a very intense period of conflict during this time. North Korea also carries out several assassination attempts against Park Chung Yi. Okay, in, in uh, 1968, there's a kind of daring raid on the Blue House. They send these elite co uh, commandos down to the south. They get within uh, very close. They get very close to the Blue House before they're stopped by the South Korean troops. Uh, but they were aiming to kill, to assassinate Park Chung Yi. There's another attempt in 1969. They put a bomb in the cemetery, but it goes off too early. Um, uh, later, this is kind of unrelated to the security crisis, but in 1974, there's actually another assassination attempt on Pak Chung Yi. This time it's by a um, Korean who resides in Japan, who's kind of loyal to North Korea, comes over to South Korea, fires a gun at Pak Chung Yi as he's giving a speech. Um, and actually ends up killing Pak Chung Yi's wife, okay, Yu Gyeong Su. So Pak Chung Yi's wife dies in 1974 um, at this kind of assassination attempt. So there's a lot of violence going on around this time. On the one hand, there's kind of the North Korea has to feel pressure to help out its um, communist comrades. But what often gets lost here as well is that uh, Pak Chung Yi himself was also engage in some aggression here. Okay, it wasn't just defensive South Korea. So we know this from uh, documents now that have been released, especially the, the American documents who are kind of monitoring what's going on in South Korea. Pak Chung Yi, because of the Vietnam War, was getting all these kind of concessions from the United States, contracts, aid, grants, uh, money for the soldiers that kind of thing, weapons, okay, so he's getting all these kind of concessions for the United States, and as a way of kind of extracting more from the United States, he wanted to kind of up the tension on the Korean Peninsula, okay, so to show, hey, we're, we're helping you guys in Vietnam, meanwhile, we're having all these problems with North Korea, you guys need to help out more, okay, so as a way of kind of extracting more from the United States, he, at his own part, was also kind of ramping up the tension, during this period. So it's also talked about how, like, uh, for example, the Blue House raid was actually a reaction, right, to something that, an operation that the South Koreans had done around this time, okay? So this is the internal security crisis going on at this time. It's going to be a big kind of justification for why uh, Pak Chung Yi abandons democracy, as we'll see. Okay, next we have the, um, what I call kind of external security crisis. Okay, so on the one hand, we have this intensifying north-south rivalry. On the other hand, we also have this um, problems with the South Korea-United States relationship. 
Okay. So during this period, as I mentioned, uh, Park Chung is kind of trying to ramp up the tension with uh, the, the conflict with North Korea. He's asking for more United States help, and he's kind of ends up being disappointed. Okay, he doesn't seem to be getting the response he's hoping for in the United States. On the other hand, the United States is getting very frustrated. Okay, they're already fighting a war in Vietnam. They don't want to get dragged into a conflict with South Korea. They think Pak Chung is being overly belligerent. Okay, they start to get very frustrated with Pak Chung So a couple events really kind of magnify this conflict, really amplify, amplify this conflict. Okay, so first of all, January 23rd, 1968, you have what's known as the capture of the USS Pueblo, okay? So this is an American spy ship, okay? It was sailing in North Korean waters, spying on North Korea. The North Koreans managed to capture the ship, okay? They capture the ship, they capture the crew, okay? This is, this is a very big embarrassment to the United States. Um, Still to this day, the USS Pueblo is in Pyongyang, okay, on the on the, the river. It's the Taedong River there, right? And it's kind of an it's like a required part of the tour. If you go on a kind of tourist trip to North Korea, they're gonna take you to the US Pueblo and kind of tell you about the US imperialism there, but also kind of um uh be proud of their victory here, right? So um the the North Korea captures this USS Pueblo. Park Tung wants to respond, right, very aggressively. The United States decide to negotiate. So they give the North Koreans some concessions, and they manage to get their crew back. North Koreans keep the ship, but this kind of resolves that situation to the disappointment of Park Tung okay? Next, April 15th, 1969, North Korea shoots down a spy plane. Okay, it's an American spy plane flying over North Korea. They shoot it down. It's called EC-121. Um, again, the Pak Chung thinks we should respond aggressively to this, right? But the, U the United States, meanwhile, is, is saying, well, North Korea is kind of responding here to South Korean aggression. Okay, so they're kind of getting very frustrated with Pak Chung Uh They don't want to get dragged into further conflict. They decide to just kind of let this go. Okay, so Pak Chung is getting very disappointed. He's like, I thought we were supposed to be allies now. We're helping you fight in Vietnam, but you're not really doing your part to help us in South Korea. Okay. But things are only going to get worse. Okay, much worse from here. What we have in this picture here, right on the right, is President Nixon. So President Nixon comes to office in 1969. He has some very different ideas about U.S. foreign policy, okay? So his idea is we need to get out of the Vietnam War, okay? We're, we're spending too much money in this war. And as part of that, he's also going to uh, talk about basically pulling back from the U.S. presence in Asia, okay? So July 25th, July 25th, 1969, um, in in Guam, he gives this kind of speech, which is known as the sometimes known as the Guam Doctrine, sometimes also described as the Nixon Doctrine. Okay, and he talks about Asians need to ensure their own security. Okay, the United States can't ensure the security of Asians anymore. We're going to have to pull out of Asia. You guys have to do it yourself. Okay. This is very kind of scary. For South Korea, right? They've had this U.S. troop presence on the Korean Peninsula. They are very nervous by this a speech like this. Nixon's already talking about kind of abandoning South Vietnam and its struggle in this war. This war, right? Uh, the Vietnam War. Then Nixon decides in December 1969 that he's going to start pulling troops out of South Korea. Okay, so he's going to begin a, what is called a phased withdrawal. Not only does he kind of decide to do this policy, but he doesn't discuss it at all with Pak Chung-hee. He doesn't kind of um, couch it in a very 
polite, what we would say with kind of polite terms, like basically approaching Park Chung Yi like we're equals, right? And let's kind of talk about this. No, he just kind of calls him up, informs him, hey, we're pulling out. This is kind of some kind of shock to Park Chung who thought the Korean participation in Vietnam, again, would kind of raise South Korea's status vis-a-vis -vis the United States. No. Nixon says, we're pulling out of um, South Korea. The first phase begins in June 1971. The United States pull out, pull out 20,000 troops. This is, as a kind of aside here, this is a very important kind of contingency in understanding uh, South Korea-United States relations, okay? Because some of you may know, Nixon ends up being uh, kind of mired in the scandal known as Watergate right? The Watergate scandal, this kind of corruption scandal. He is, ends up having to kind of resign from office, okay? If he hadn't resigned from office, it's pretty likely, who knows what would happen for sure, but it's pretty likely he would have actually withdrawn all the troops from South Korea, okay? There would be no more troops in South Korea today. So it's kind of interesting contingency here. So Nixon is talking about this new Nixon doctrine. He's uh, withdrawing trips from South Korea. Meanwhile, he's going to China in 1971. Okay, this kind of the big kind of communist enemy in China. He's going and shaking hands with Mao, making deals with communists. Right? Um, he decides to. Um, um, he kind of puts pressure on the UN to change its recognition, okay, its official recognition. Up to this point in the UN Security Council, it is Taiwan, nationalist China, who has held a seat on the Security Council. Now it will switch out. People's Republic of China will finally take its seat at the uh, Security Council. Eventually, South Korea, uh, so the United States will abandon its recognition of Taiwan in favor of recognizing the People's Republic of China. From the South Korean perspective, they've just abandoned Taiwan, right? And finally, we have the fall of Saigon in 1975, right? So the South has lost its war with the North. The Vietnam has become a communist nation, right? This is very shocking for South Koreans, right? Around this time, it creates a lot of fear, a lot of kind of nervousness, right? The fact that the Americans basically abandoned Vietnam, it became communist, is the same thing going to happen on the Korean Peninsula, right? Are the Americans going to leave? Are we going to have to fight a war with the North again? That kind of thing, okay? So this is the second part of the security crisis going on at this time. Meanwhile, we also have a social crisis around this time, right? Um, so this economic development that has been going on since, you know, maybe 1965 or maybe a little bit earlier, it's beginning to create these big changes in South Korean society, okay? It's becoming more and more urbanized. Seoul is growing. And they're also creating a working class. So a new kind of social structure, okay? And the working class is beginning to become very frustrated, very angry about the conditions, okay? So this is, uh, we're gonna talk about next week, but one of the kind of most important aspects of the South Korean economic miracle is that they had cheap workers, okay? And these workers were able to um, do this work for cheap and that kind of gave South Korea this comparative advantage on the international market. But it was very hard for these workers and they're kind of wondering like, how much do we have to sacrifice? When do we have to sac keep sacrificing, right? When will this end? So very symbolically, not November 13th, 1970, we have this event, Jung Tae-il is one of these workers at a, at a textile factory. Um, so if you go in Seoul down to the Cheonggyecheon, Cheonggyecheon, it's like this little stream that kind of runs through the center of Jungno in Seoul, the center of Seoul. There's all still all these old textile factories around here. And at some point, if you look around, you'll be able to see a statue of Jun Tae-il. And this is the exact spot where Jun Tae-il, um, in, in kind of protest against the government, set himself on fire. Okay, so this is known as self-immolation. So it's an act of protest against the government. 
drawing attention to an issue through this kind of dramatic act of self-immolation, right? And he's like calling on the government to kind of respect the workers, okay? So this is a very important event for kind of galvanizing, for uh, provoking, triggering a working class movement, a working class consciousness. It's kind of like, yeah, we're experiencing all this injustice. We've got to get together and kind of resist this, uh, this, yes, gentil. Um, are my, oh my, oh, I just realized my, my chat hasn't been going to everyone. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I've been typing all this stuff and it's not going. Okay. I changed it to everyone. Everything I type now will go to everyone. Sorry about that. Um, so this was, a uh, um, sets, sets himself on fire, ignites this working class movement. So Patung is feeling this pressure from below. This kind of social movement. Meanwhile, we have this urbanization. We have slums forming in Seoul. People getting angry. They know that these um, this economic growth is not creating economic opportunities for everyone. Um, it's also bad for Park Chung Yi's kind of uh, voting for his popularity, right? Because it, as it turns out, the the cities are, are tending to vote against Park Chung Yi is voting for the opposition party, and he's kind of has his base of electoral support in the countryside. So as the cities are growing and the countryside is relatively shrinking, that's actually shrinking his the support, right? His electoral support. Okay, so that's also something that's kind of threatening his power. So this is the social crisis. Okay, next, last, this is the final crisis here. We also have an economic crisis. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about this next week. For now, it's just important to mention that he's also kind of having this downturn in the economy at this time. Okay, because um, Pak Chung Yi, his, his whole kind of platform, his whole legitimacy depends on economic development. If the economy is kind of in decline, what else does he have, right? Why is he here? So this is, again, another crisis. Doesn't look like he's going to be able to perpetuate his rule. Um, so what happens? Um, there are all these kind of companies going bankrupt. Okay, they have um, been... Uh, the textile market is kind of in decline. They've been taking out loans, uh, private loans. These are known as private loans or curbside loans. So they're taking private loans from kind of, well, people on the street, from private lenders to pay off their bank loans. Okay? Pay off the interest on their bank loans as their companies are in decline. It's kind of creating this economic crisis. Companies are kind of uh, going bankrupt. The companies go to Pak Chung and they ask him, hey, you've got to bail us out or else this economy is going to collapse. Okay, so what happens is Pak Chung passes the August 3rd measure. Okay, and he kind of bails out these, uh, these companies by uh, putting a freeze on curbside loans. Okay, so here in the newspaper, uh, this says, Modern Giyap Sate Dongyal. Okay, so a freeze on all. Um, private loans to companies. Okay, so he basically sides with the companies against these kind of private lenders. Um, and through that, he's able to forge a new alliance with business. Okay, this is very important for moving forward with his rule. Okay, so here's the point here, right? We have all, we've had um, this kind of, um, all these crises, crises kind of threatening Pak Chung Yi's legitimacy. So finally, August, no, sorry, October 17th, 1972, Pak Chung Yi declares martial law. He dissolves the National Assembly. He suspends the Constitution and he declares a new Constitution. So basically, he just throws out the old Constitution, um, writes a new Constitution. It's known as the Yushin. Constitution. Okay, so this in English can be um, translated as restoration. Okay, so it's, a, it's also sometimes called the Yushin Restoration. So it's a new constitution basically doing away with elections and declaring himself president for life. Okay, so it's not um, explicit in this way. What happens basically, you, you create a system in which um, Pak Chung Yi is no longer directly elected, but directed by this kind of council that Pak Chung Yi appoints himself. 
He also takes control of the National Assembly by appointing one third of National Assembly um, uh, members. And now instead of the National Assembly making legislation, he's going to rule by decree. Okay, he actually uses the word emergency decree. Okay, so he just passes these decrees. So, for example, he passes a decree you're not allowed to criticize the Constitution. For example, that's the new law now. So, if you criticize the Constitution, you're arrested. Okay, so this is um, so basically what we see is Pak Chung Yi takes power through a coup d'etat. He um, has this kind of um, initial crisis overcoming this Japanese normalization, but he creates economic development, creates a basis for legitimacy, but then soon kind of squanders this legitimacy through a series of crises, through pursuing long-term power, okay? And in 1972, finally just decides, I'm going to just do away with any kind of veneer with any kind of semblance of democracy and just kind of go outright authoritarianism. And again, in the background, um, very important, the fact that the Americans seem to be drawing out. This is how we can kind of understand at this around this time, uh, South Korea and Philippines in the same context, right? It's right around this time as well that Marcos also kind of de declares himself president for life, right? Kind of embarks on the same path um, as the Americans are seem to be withdrawing, okay? So, so far, I think we've seen that um, there's a lot of conflict, right? Uh, char characterizing South Korean political history up to this point, right? This is a little bit different, I would say, from this idea that it's just kind of a gradual process of growth and maturation, right? Like a, like a flower blooming or something. Especially when we think about that Yushin, in a way, if that's the explanation, right? Yushin is kind of like a step backward. Right, it's not like starting out authoritarian and then gradually becoming more democratic, right? Because Yushin has actually becomes um, much the most intense period of, author of authoritarianism, right? From 1972 to 1987. Now we're going to have this kind of most intense period of authoritarianism in South Korea. Okay, so before we move on, why don't we stop there for a ten minute break? Does that sound all right? Yes, sure, Professor. We can have a one more break. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I just uh, copy and pasted the stuff I, I was typing in the first half. I typed a lot of stuff. It was a private message instead of a message to everyone. I just copy and pasted that in the chat room in case you're interested. I know. A lot of it's out of context now, but at least it's there now. Um, okay, let's get back to it. So we have these kind of crises, and we have Pak Chung-hee declaring himself present for life in 1972 with the Yushin Declaration. So now we come to the end of the Pak Chung-hee. We're skipping over a bit in the 70s here. October 26, 1979, Pak chung -hee's rule ends um, with assassination. He's killed, okay? So very dramatic end to Pak chung -hee. It's a begins with a coup d'etat, right? Ends with assassination, very dramatic period. A lot of violence during this period. So maybe it's a little bit characteristic, right? That the, the end of his reign will also uh, end in violence. Um, Right. So what happens on 1979? I'll just talk a little bit about the background of this assassination. It's a very exciting, I mean, kind of dramatic event. It's uh, made for a couple films about this, a lot of uh, media stuff written on why, you know, the, the kind of behind the scenes fighting that led to this assassination. If you're interested, a good movie to watch is The Man Standing Next. In Korean, it's um, Namsan Pujangde. It's a movie about Pak Chung Yi's assassination, in case you're interested. Um, so, uh, the background. Okay, so we begin in uh, August 1979 with what's known as the YH incident. 
So what happened? There was a a, a wig making company called YH. It was mostly, uh, it was uh, sorry, not mostly. It was all there's 180, 187 workers. They were all women. The company kind of suddenly declared bankruptcy, and all these women were kind of they were out of a job, and they were out the kind of pay they were also owed. And they were very suspicious that there was some kind of corruption going on here, right? The owners kind of escaping with all this money. So they decided to protest this bankruptcy de- declaration. And in order to kind of gather support for their protest, they decided to occupy the opposition party's headquarters, right? So immediately kind of politicize this uh, uh, protest. And what happened was the um, police uh, eventually storm this uh, occupation headquarters to kind of bring out the women who were, who were sitting in there. Uh, and one ends up killed in the crackdown. Okay, so there's this kind of dramatic event here that, again, galvanizes people to protest against the Park Chung-hee incident. And Kim Young-sam, who we've, I think, I'm not sure if we've mentioned him yet, but Kim Young-sam is the leader of the opposition around this time. Um, does this very famous interview with the New York Times uh, where he calls on the United States. He says, you need to step in in Korea. You need to restore democracy because we have this dictator in Korea who's kind of violent, corrupt, and so forth. And Park jung responds by kicking Kim Young-sam out of the National Assembly. He says, you basically committed a kind of treasonous act that doesn't that disallows you now from being a politician by kind of calling on this foreign power basically to intervene right in Korean politics. So Kim Kim Young Sam is expelled from the National Assembly. This sets off demonstrations in the cities of Busan and Masan. Okay, um, so actually Busan is Kim Young Sam's hometown, even though it's a really big city, right? A big city. It's his hometown. It's kind of political base. Protests begin in Busan, they spread to Masan, and this goes on for about 10 days. You kind of have these massive demonstrations in Busan, Masan. And what happens here is this sets off a debate within the Park jung regime, okay? How to respond to these protests? What should we do, okay? And there are basically two kind of opinions within Park jung inner circle about how to deal with these um uh, with these protests. On the one hand, you have Cha Ji Chol. Okay, Cha Ji Chol is uh, back when you saw that picture of the coup d'etat. He was the one standing to the right of Park Chung Yee. By this time, he's head of Park Chung Yee's personal security. Okay, someone who kind of whispering into Park Chung Yee's ear. Cha Ji Chol is a hardliner. Okay, so his idea is what we need to do is violently suppress these demonstrations, roll in the tanks. That's his idea for how to deal with these demonstrations. Okay, he's basically calling them communists and whatnot. On the other hand, we have Kim Jae-gyu. Kim Jae-gyu is the head of the KCIA. So KCIA is the uh, Korean Intelligence Service. Okay, it's another one of these... um, fundamental institutions, along with the security law, right, which is uh, um, important for um, reinforcing the uh, the way in which uh, Park jung regime is able to maintain um, its government. So Kim Jae-kyu is the head of the KCIA. He is more of a soft aligner. Okay, so he's telling Park jung we need to negotiate. Okay, so we'll work out a deal with the opposition to bring these demonstrations to the end and then move on with our politics, okay? And so at a dinner at October 26, on October 26, 1979, they're eating, they're having this discussion, and it kind of turns into a fight about what to do, right? And basically, it seems that Park jung is leaning towards Cha ji position, okay? And he's kind of pushing pushing away Kim Jae-gyu, kind of criticizing him for being, you know, weak and for letting these demonstrations get out of hand, okay? And what happens is Kim Jae-gyu at one point gets up from the table and leaves, okay? And when he returns, he has a gun in his hand and he very suddenly shoots Park Jung-hee and shoots Cha Ji-chao and kills them both, 
Okay. So there's some speculation about why he did that. Was it just kind of a sudden moment of rage, right? Or was there kind of some kind of strategy? Was this a coup d'etat, for example? So Kim Jae-gyu in his trial, which followed the assassination, justified his actions in the name of democracy. Okay, so what he said was Park jung was going to kind of roll in the tanks, you know, and he was pursuing a lifelong rule. So to restore democracy, I had to kill Park jung Okay, So I did it in the name of democracy. It wasn't, uh, didn't persuade the, the judge. He was uh, eventually put to death for his assassination of Park jung But that was his story. Since then, we've had a lot of kind of uh, research or investigation of what was going on behind the scenes. We know that he had a very tense relationship with Cha Ji Chao. Okay, so there was an ongoing personal rivalry there. They really hated each other. Okay, and he really hated that Pak Chung Yi was starting to lean towards Cha Ji Chao. And also, there's a kind of history here of these directors of the KCIA when they have a falling out with Pak Chung Yi, when they begin to grow apart, they're either kind of fired, uh, they have to go into exile, they sometimes end up dead. Okay, so Kim Jae Gyu might have had a fear for his own life, basically. He was beginning to kind of fail. Pak Chung Yi was beginning to fall out with him. So he thought if he didn't kind of act, eventually he would be killed or have to go into exile or something like that. So there's also this very personal motivation here, which looks to be very persuasive in explaining why he killed Pak Chung Yi. Ultimately, though, this be, uh, brings an end to the Pak Chung Yi era. Okay, so before we move on, I'll just mention uh, some of the important legacies of Pak Chung Yi. We'll be talking more about these next week. So, number one is the economy, right? So, the economy begins this kind of economic takeoff under Pak Chung Yi, and that's why, for many people, Pak Chung Yi is a hero today, right? But he also has the legacies of creating the KCIA, right? This uh, intelligence agency, which is um, very powerful still today. Um, he creates the Jebo, right? So Jebo are the kind of big conglomerates in South Korea, these, these massive businesses that are become kind of too big to fail and now are a huge part kind of structurally of Korean society today, right? So, uh, companies like Samsung or Hyundai. Uh, during this period, you also have the beginning of a much more intense struggle between the democratization movement and Park chung as we'll see, that's going to be important moving forward. And we also have, a, very importantly, this kind of deferred unification. So this is an important legacy, right? So Park chung basically came along and said, yes, we want unification, but we have to kind of put that as a distant goal in the future, okay? We have to pursue economic development first and unification later. Right. This is important from the standpoint of today, right? Thinking about how that kind of turned out. Yes, South Korea is very prosperous today, right? But we don't have unification, right? And that's kind of what he was promising. So that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about Pak Chung Yi's legacy as well. Okay. So in the wake of uh, Pak Chung Yi's um, assassination, we have what's known as the Seoul Spring. So this is a similar kind of period to what happened after uh, Syngman Rhee's deposal in 1968, that kind of democratic interlude. We have another kind of democratic interlude in 1979. There's a lot of hope around this time, right? We finally got rid of Pak Chung Yi. It's time to kind of have real democracy, time for real freedom, time for worrying about the problems of economic distribution, these other social problems, that kind of thing, right? However, if you're familiar with European history during the Cold War, there's something called the Prague Spring, okay? And that, if you're familiar with this history of the Prague Spring, you'll know that this Seoul Spring is not going to turn out well, okay? So basically, what happened in Prague Spring, that the Czech Republic kind of rose up and de demanded kind of independence from the Soviet Union, liberalizing reforms, and the Soviets rolled in the tanks, kind of violently suppressed this uprising, okay? so. This is why they've taken this name, right? Well, as we'll see for the Soul Spring. So what happens with Pak Chung Yi's um, assassination? Um, che gyu ha who was a high-ranking official in the Pak Chung Yi administration, 
is named kind of interim president, right? We need somebody at the helm during this very, this period of uncertainty um, before we can kind of establish a new system. Chaguha steps up. He's the interim president, kind of temporary president. Although he doesn't really have necessarily legitimacy or a mandate, at least he claims to support return to popular elections. Okay, so that's his idea. Let's have elections. He revokes the emergency decrees passed under Pak Chung So these kind of very heavily authoritarian decrees, like you can't criticize the constitution, that kind of thing. He restores the rights of opposition figures like Kim Young Sam, who were you know pushed aside by Pak Chung Yi. He reopens universities, okay, which were closed during a period of martial law. And so this begins a period basically of liberalization, right? It looks like South Korea is kind of moving in a more liberal, democratic uh, direction under Che Gu Ha. But in the background, we also have the emergence of an import, another important soldier which is Jun Du Hwan. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about him a little bit, his background on the next side. But for now, we need to talk about um, how this soul spring kind of unravels, right? So Jun Du Hwan is uh, appointed the uh, director of the military security command around this time. So that is the institution that is in charge of investigating the assassination of Pak Chung-hee. Who, or sorry, why did Kim Jae-gyu kill Pak Chung-hee? Was there some kind of conspiracy, right? And how far does this kind of conspiracy stretch within the ranks of the Korean elite at this time? So Jun Doo-hwan is tasked with investigating this assassination. And what he does, he uses this power to kind of arrest opponents, arrest political opponents, and take control of the military. Okay, so he's got his own kind of clique, his own kind of loyal group within the military. And by arresting these other kind of powerful guys within the military, he's able to appoint his own guys and seize control of the military. Okay, Um, so this quite dramatically. These arrests take place on December 12th, 1979. So I believe uh, a couple years ago, right, the the film is Saudebom. Uh, and then in in English, it was called 1212 The Day. This film depicts these events, right? In December 12th, Chen Duan kind of is Caesar of control of the military. But this is um, known as the first step in what is referred to as Chen Duan's rolling coup, okay? So whereas Pak jung coup took place very suddenly, it was over very quickly, Chen Duan's coup is going to take place over in stages, over a few months. Okay, so this is the first stage. He takes control of the military. Then in April 1980, he appoints himself director of the KCIA. Okay, so now he's in charge of the military. He's in charge of the main intelligence agency. Okay, he's basically now de facto the most powerful man in the country. So he's not necessarily president, right? Che Guha's president. But behind the scenes, he's the one with all the power now. Okay, so this again meets with a very intense reaction from civil society. People are very upset about Jun Duan. They're nervous where he's going, you know, with these power grabs. So students begin to take to the streets. Okay, so here we have pictured May fifteenth, nineteen eighty. You have about a hundred thousand. Students gather in front of Seoul Station. I don't know if you can see here in the background, but this is um, Seoul Station, the train station, right? The old one that was built under the Japanese. If you go to Seoul Station these days, great big new station. But over on the side, you can still see where the old train station is. So the students gather here and they kind of demand that uh, a return, basically to kind of um, Jun Duan to respect the kind of changes that Che Guha is carrying out and to carry out popular elections, okay? So, um, Chen Duan responds by declaring martial law, okay? So obviously he decides for the kind of hard line approach here, right? And this is uh, going to lead very importantly to probably what is considered to be the most important event in the kind of history of South Korean democratization, okay? 
Uh, before we talk about that, just talk a little bit of background about Jun Duhuan. So Jun Duhuan is also one of these people from North Gyeongsang province, right? I believe I already wrote it. I'll, I'll write it again just in case. North Gyeongsang province. Okay, so this is the same kind of region where Park Jung is from, Gumi, Daegu, this kind of area. So again, kind of protect, perpetuating this rule by a, a certain kind of regional elite. Um, through Park Jung-hee, Jun Duhan. He's also a soldier, right? So there's this kind of continuity, strong continuity between him and uh, Park Jung-hee. Um, he's also a um, Vietnam veteran. Okay, so he fought in the Vietnam War. But there's also, I think, um, argument here for a kind of break with the Park Jung-hee regime. So one thing that's very inter interesting difference between him and Park Jung-hee. Park Jung-hee was, like I said, um, raised during the colonial period, um, basically very comfortable with uh, having a close relationship with Japan, um, working with Japan for Korea's economic development, speaking Japanese. Jun Duan was kind of post-war generation, right? He did not feel as comfortable around Japanese as uh, Park jung Yi did, much more um, eager to work closely with the United States. Okay, so he wanted to bring South Korea back closer to the United States. That was a little bit different. That's something that separated him from Park chung yi However, he, unlike Park chung yi was um, racked. He was hindered by a legitimacy deficit. Okay. Uh, so the reason for this Park jung -hee, he had this coup d'etat, but he was able to basically make up for this by more or less, uh, roughly, creating economic development, right? So that's where Park jung -hee kind of drew his legitimacy from, creating economic development. However, because Jun Du Hwan, as we'll see, came to power with what ended up being a very bloody coup, he was never able to recover. Okay, even though actually South Korea will undergo much more higher rates of economic growth during the 1980s. Okay, the economy is going to end up actually growing even much more intensely than it did under Park Jung-hee. He never recovers his legitimacy because of this initial power grab, which ends up being a very bloody coup. Okay, and this leads us to the events of May 18th, um, 1980, what's also known as the Gwangju Uprising. Okay, also we could call it the Gwangju Massacre, right? So we mentioned that uh, Jun Duan, the students are gathering, they're demanding the return to, of um, popular elections. Jun Duan declares martial law, okay? On May 18th in the city of Gwangju, which is in South Jela province, okay? That's in the South uh, West. Um, the students, um, they gather in front of the university, which is now closed. Soldiers are kind of um, guarding the gates to these universities, making sure students aren't allowed to go into the university. They start to kind of protest, demonstrate, resist. They, they demand that they open the university and they get into this initial kind of um, skirmish, okay? Initial kind of confrontation with the soldiers, okay? Nothing really out of the ordinary here, except that the, the soldiers actually respond extremely violently. Okay, so there's no kind of like tit for tat escalation here. The students um, start to protest and the, the, right away the soldiers respond very harshly to these protests. Okay, so they, they charge the crowd with um, clubs, okay, beating the students and with bayonets. Okay, so the kind of the, the knife or the sword on the end of the rifle kind of also stabbing the students, okay? So 10 are injured um, or about throughout the day. 10 are initially injured. By the end of the day, it's around um, 80 students have been injured in these initial skirmishes with the soldiers. So as it turns out, these soldiers who have been sent there, they've actually been trained in anti-guerrilla warfare. Okay, so they're not really trained for dealing with demonstrators. They're tra trained for a kind of war situation where these are communists, okay? And that's what they're trained to do, right? Communists are not someone to be kind of negotiated with or, you know, handled lightly. 
So this leads to an escalation. Okay, so you have this initial confrontation. The next day, not just the students, but also the ordinary citizens of Guangzhou begin to join the students. They're outraged by this response by the soldiers, right? So these students are just demanding that the university be reopened, right? And um, obviously, you know, echoing the students' cries in Seoul for the return to popular elections. So the ordinary citizens join. Wow, okay, so we're gonna, our time is going really quick. I gotta wrap this up. So the ordinary citizens join and this leads to further clashes with the soldiers, okay? Um, they have tens of thousands of people gathering to uh, fight these soldiers. By May 20th, the soldiers begin to fire into the crowd. Okay, they're, they're firing their rifles into the crowd. So the citizens angered further. They decided to arm themselves. Okay, they break into some police stations and armories, and they start to distribute guns. Okay, they form a kind of citizen's army to resist these soldiers. The soldiers are quite taken aback by the kind of level of resistance, kind of organization of the people in Guangzhou. So they decide to withdraw. From, they need to regroup. They rethink their strategy. So this leads to a period of five days, a period of self-rule in Guangzhou. Okay, they, they draw up some demands. They are hoping to negotiate with the government, but ultimately they want, you know, these kind of demands, restoring democracy, right? Jun Duan to kind of step down. But what happens on May 27, you have this kind of brutal crackdown. Okay. Um, and this brings an end to the Guangzhou uprising. There's very varying estimates here, okay, but how many were killed is quite quite different. Um, but anywhere between 500 and and several thousand, okay, killed here during this Guangzhou uprising. So what happens is this leads to a kind of radicalization of the student movement in the 1980s, okay? So the students up to this time have been the kind of driving force of resistance to the authoritarian regimes. But what happens after 1980, they start to feel like they need to do something much more radical, right? Because Pak Chung Yee was brought down, but this didn't bring an end to authoritarianism, right? So this starts to look like there's some kind of deeper structure in South Korean society. It wasn't just that Pak Chung Yee was a bad guy. There's some kind of structure maintaining this authoritarian rule. And in this context, they really begin to question the role of the United States in South Korea. They, they begin to kind of criticize the United States as rather than kind of supporting the movement towards democracy, actually kind of upholding these authoritarian regimes in the name of um, anti-communism, right? So they look at the, the Gwangju uprising, for example, and they point to how the troops that were moved to Guangzhou were actually moved from the DMZ, right, which requires coordination with the uh, U.S. generals in South Korea, right? So they're looking at whether, you know, the generals were kind of actively or pa at least passively supporting this, these troop movements that led to Guangzhou. And you also had in Washington basically kind of passive stance. They were, they were actually viewing Guangzhou very much through the lens of the Iranian Revolution, which began in 1979. They were worried basically that this Guangzhou was kind of lead to something like that in, in Iran. So the students become radicalized. This begins kind of very strong anti-Americanism among the students. They start to read uh, Marxism very intensely, even though it's illegal, but through these kind of um, smuggled, you know, texts, start to study revol um, Marxism, start to think about bringing about revolutionary change in South Korean society. And it also leads to a reassessment of North Korea, right? So if the government says North Korea is bad, right, then maybe we should be thinking critically about that. Maybe there's actually a different story to be told here. And the students start to learn about uh, Juche uh, thought, right? Juche Sasang or Juche thought, which is the ideolo ideology of North Korea, right, supposedly kind of created by Kim Il-sung. So they're very inspired by these uh, North Korean ideas as well. And this leads to a very intense battle between the students and the Jun Duan government in the 1980s. And as I said, Jun Duan never really able to recover from Gwangju, his legitimacy, even though he creates under during his reign, this kind of massive economic growth. OK, so the, ultimately, this culminates in 1987 in the June struggle. 
Okay, we have um, what happens is in, in April 1987, Jun has been carrying out these negotiations with the opposition to um, um, create a new constitution. And he abruptly kind of ends them. He, he says that the opposition is too divided. We have the Olympics coming up in 1988. So Seoul actually will end up hold, hosting the Summer Olympics in 1988. So he says, we need to put reform on hold, right? Let's just prioritize st stability for now. So this, um, the students react to this by taking to the streets, okay? Then in the same month in April, news of an SNU student who has been killed while being detained uh, by the secret police in, in January comes out. This news is revealed. It turns out he's been waterboarded, okay, drowned, basically, tortured, tortured and drowned. So this really um, um, motivates to students. If you've heard of this movie, 1987, When the Day Comes, this, this movie, this movie is uh, de depicting these kind of events, okay? Um, then on June 9th, we have a this image here. This is a Yonsei student named um, Yi Han Yeol is um, knocked unconscious. He'll eventually die in hospital, goes into a coma by being struck by a tear gas canister. Okay. Um, this is a very dramatic event because it's caught on camera. Okay. And by this time, the international media is very much has its eye on South Korea because it's just ahead of the Seoul Olympics. And there's a lot of concern about whether we'll actually be able to go ahead with the Olympics. Okay. So this creates this kind of international image of students, you know, being uh, killed by the um, suppression forces, right? Creates a lot of sympathy for the democratic movement. Then on June 20th, the regime kind of very insensitively, right? Kind of um, responds by appointing a new successor. Okay, so rather than returning to popular elections, Jun Tae-yu apports a new successor. That's Ro Tae-yu. Um, and this um, is kind of the last straw. Okay, so they've had these, um, um, they've had these revelations of students being killed. They've had students being killed on camera quite dramatically. Now the, the regime has responded by just kind of appointing a successor. Um, so they, by this time, we have a kind of mass movement, okay? So it's not just students, not just intellectuals, not just the political opposition, but the joining of the middle class, okay? So people who are just kind of uh, working, trying to get by, who are enjoying the fruits of Korea's economic development, they, they're also, uh, they're noted for their wearing of neckties, right? These people wearing neckties are joining the, the demonstrations. So now the government finally decides it's time to give in. Okay, so this leads to the June 29th dec declaration. Okay, in 1987, this is Ro Tae um, decides to return to popular elections. Okay, so this is known as the kind of point. We've had um, all this kind of struggle for democracy over the years. 1987, return to popular elections. And basically since then, we've had the perpetuation of the system we know today. In South Korea. Okay, so kind of we can see it as a kind of turning point in South Korean history. Um, but there's also a strong continuity that comes out of this. Okay. Um, the, the way that the regime handles this, they are able to split the democratization movement. Okay, so by offering this kind of carrot of popular elections, a lot of the social demands of the democratization movement. The demands for unification kind of get put aside. Okay, so you have these students, the workers, the intellectuals, the opposition. The opposition basically abandons this movement now. Okay, so they're saying, oh, return to popular elections. Okay, we've achieved our goal now. It's kind of over, right? Whereas these kind of workers and these other people are still advocating for change, but the movement's kind of split now, right? So the regime is kind of able to undermine these greater demands for social change by um, returning to elections. They're also able to capture the presidency 
In 1987, the presidential election, Roteu ends up winning the election with somewhere in the high 30s. Okay, a plurality of the vote. He does this because the opposition splits. Two candidates, Kim Dae-jung, Kim Young-sam, they can't agree on who should represent the opposition. They form their own parties. They split the opposition vote. Together, they combined, you know, somewhere in the high 60s, 70s of the popular vote, right? So there was a lot of support for the opposition, but the regime is able to perpetuate itself, survive into the post-1987 era through this kind of maneuvering, okay? So there is um, here this argument for kind of sharp break, right? A new era, but there's also an argument here for continuity between these authoritarian eras and the post-1987 era, which is very important. Okay, I know I've gone over my time here. I'm sorry I didn't manage my time better, um, but I will I want to quickly go through this analysis here, like trying to present narratives of how to put all this information together, and then we'll get to your questions. Okay, I, hope, I wanna leave plenty of time for your questions. Please bear with me for a few more minutes here, and then we'll get to your questions, okay? So our final section, analysis, understanding Korean democratization. How do we put these this information together, right? When we try to kind of explain why Korea is a democracy today, if we kind of, you know, we meet somebody who's not really familiar with South Korean history, they ask about the history, you know, why is South Korea a democracy today? How are we going to explain it to them, right? So we saw in that initial video we saw, right, that they really emphasized the fact that South Korea was established in 1948 as a liberal democracy, and then it was just kind of a gradual process of growth, right? But as I've been em emphasizing today, we, if we look at the history, there's also this evidence of a very strong struggle, right? So I've defined these two kind of narratives of explaining Korean democratization. On the one hand, we have this narrative of modernization. And on the other hand, we have this narrative of struggle, okay? From the modernization narrative, it's kind of a top-down process. You have the establishment of the state. You have the writing of this constitution, okay? And then we have these politicians who are kind of um, uh, gradually moving towards democracy, right? And very important in this process is the laying the foundation for democracy through economic development, okay? So basically, by 1987, South Korea has finally gone through this process of growth enough that it's ready. For democratization. Okay, so this is this narrative of um, establishment and then a kind of gradual evolution or growth towards democracy. That's what I call the modernization narrative. Okay, and on the other hand, we have this narrative of struggle, right? The idea that yes, we had this establishment of liberal democracy in 1948, but again and again, we see these leaders who are trying to kind of hold on to their power, trying to extend their power, and it's up to the civil society to kind of take democracy, right? Without this struggle for democracy, without kind of taking democracy by struggling with the regime, it would have been impossible to ever achieve democracy. We see that even in 1987 to the very end, the regime was very kind of working hard to hold on to its power. And only in the end, they kind of made this calculated maneuver, right? They can hold on to power by going through elections. Did we actually finally have this transfer to uh, what we know today as democracy, right? So these are two narratives, modernization and struggle. Depending on which kind of narrative framework we view this process, we tend to emphasize the importance of different events. Okay, so the modernization narrative, we have the founding of South Korea. We have this process of economic growth, okay? And then finally, on June 29th, we have the return to democracy because the elite regime kind of decides it's time to return to democracy. They make this calculation, right? So this is very simplified, but again, this is the kind of top-down narrative, emphasizing founding economic growth and this kind of elite agency, okay? Then we have this narrative of struggle, which emphasizes again and again these kind of clashes with the regime, the uprising of civil society demanding change, right? So April Revolution, May 18th, Gwangju um, um, uprising, right? And then finally, the June struggle, the regime kind of collapses under the weight of this popular resistance. Okay, 
And then a kind of um, engaging with public memory here. So, uh, uh, of course, scholars tend to they tend to go to one side or the other, right? There are scholars who emphasize economic development. There are scholars who emphasize this conflict and um, popular uprising. So I've tried to pick out what I think are two good examples in public or memory, kind of representing these narratives, okay? So I don't know if you've seen these or not. Ode to my father. It's not about democratization per se, but I think in this film, you see this process of kind of very gradual development uh, uh, just kind of moving forward as a process of growth, evolution. Okay, struggle is uh, completely absent from this film. It shows South Korean history, again, um, over time, basically from the Korean War into the present. And this process of growth is very much um, center, I think, in the film like this. And then we have films like 1987, which put this kind of struggle at the center, the way in which the students and civil society demand and take. And that's what kind of moves the political development forward, okay? So we have these two different narratives. They're reflected in popular memory, right? They're also reflected in scholarship, right? So the two readings I assigned for this week, um, of course, they're not wholly on one side or the other. They're both kind of taking into account both these processes of economic development and these processes of struggle, but relative to each other, okay? I think we can see how they kind of take a side in this debate. Okay, so first, Suk Jong Lee uh, had this quote here, South Korea's dramatic movement towards democratization in 1987 and the social consensus for democratization demonstrate that participatory democracy accompanies economic development and industrialization. Okay, so here we have this emphasis on the fact that South Korea's society kind of changed with economic development. You had the emergence of this middle class and that kind of led to this demand for democracy, okay? Modernization here is the kind of key to understanding why South Korea is a democracy today, okay? And then we have on the other hand, uh, Hagen Ku's article, very much pushing back against this idea that modernization has led to South Korean democracy, okay? Korea's path to modernity has not been a smooth evolutionary process but rather a discontinuous, uneven, and conflict ridden one, determined not by some immutable logic of modernism, but by historical contingencies and a dialectical process of social change. So the modernization theorist relatively smooth process, right? A process of growth, like an organism. The society itself is like an organism that just grows and matures. Whereas from Hagen Goose, perspective, society has made up these kind of conflicting groups and forests, and as they kind of clash with each other, they fight over their interests, that's the way history moves forward. A very different way of understanding, okay? And one kind of privileges the economic development, and the other privileges this kind of social struggle, okay? So those are two ways of thinking about why South Korea's democracy today. They're both very common, and it's, it's a way for you to kind of understand, you know, where these different scholars are coming from and why they kind of see it differently, okay? And you yourself, I think, should try to think about which one you find to be persuasive, right? So this is a way of thinking about why South Korea is a democracy today. Was democratization primarily a consequence of modernization or struggle? So you'll probably say, well, teacher, it's, it's both, right? We can't, we can't exclude one or the other. So I wouldn't ask you to exclude, say it's, oh, it's only struggle, it's only modernization. But I think if you read the scholarship, you'll see Scholars tend to, in the end, kind of come down one way or the other. This is why I emphasize this word primarily here. Okay? So they come down on one side. We need really need the struggle. It's really important. Or the e without the economic development, it's just impossible, right? Something like that. And this is very important, right? How we answer this question is how we kind of draw the lessons from the South Korean experience, if it's about economic development, if it's about this kind of civil society demand, right? Those are the lessons we can draw when we're trying to learn about Korean democracy from outside Korea. We're trying to learn about other developing countries, what they can learn from Korea, right? Very different lessons. So if we go back to that video, right, that we started with, I think the lessons here, I'm not sure if there's much to be learned from here. It's basically, you need to kind of establish 
constitutional, you know, liberal democracy, and then you need to kind of have economic development, I think is basically the lesson, if there is one, right? Whereas the lesson we get from this other narrative of struggle, right? It's like democracy isn't just going to come. You really need to kind of take it from below, right? So those, those are two very different lessons we can take from these different narratives, right? And with that, okay, I'm sorry I went so long. I'm going to move into question and answer. I'll try to be much better with my time next week. Please, what are your questions? So everyone will now open the floor for questions uh, to Dr. Macri. Um, if, you're, if you want to remain anonymous with the questions, you may pass them on to me and then I'll, I'll be the one to raise them. And I, I would just add, feel free to also type them in the chat too. That's fine. If you feel like you're better at kind of articulating yourself by writing them, that's also fine. Yes, we so have I a question. From Ma'am Carmen Villanueva. Hello. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. It was very interesting. And I was thinking about how the... The economic reason was like, uh, I mean, the economic growth was like a reason to accept a dictator or or, or um, a person that it, it, it used the, all the power uh, in one way and against maybe democracy. And I was curious about how that happened because Economic growth is not a, a thing made by one person, but maybe society doing a lot of things and making the society grow. So how, how, how we can understand this economic growth, but under one guy that maybe is doing things, but I think there's more behind. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more. Thank you. Well, I mean... Thank you for your question. I think it it really points to the heart, you know, of, of what I'm talking about. Um, it's actually going to be important next week when we talk about economic development, right? And there's basically I would how I would kind of rephrase your question if I if I understand correctly. It's kind of this question of whether we kind of need authoritarianism, right, in the early stages of economic development, whether that's the kind of only way, right? We're talking maybe about this kind of developmental state narrative right so there's this idea that there's we should kind of just let developing countries be authoritarian right because they're kind of just going through this stage right and that's just kind of necessary part of the growth i think it's related to the modernization narrative right so there's this idea that kind of countries they need to go through these stages the early stages yeah we're going to have to go through some growing pains right, with this kind of social change, right? So it's more respectful or more permissive, maybe, of this authoritarian approach. But there's a, there's a debate, a lot of debate about this. So one name I would probably mention here, right, is Amartya Sen, a very famous kind of Nobel Prize winning um, scholar when it comes to developmental theory, talking about, no, well, actually freedom. We need freedom for countries to develop, right? And Actually, we can say this authoritarian is actually kind of getting in the way, right? So we see the same debates reflected in the Korean case. People, some people say we couldn't have economic growth without Park Chung Yi. And some people say, well, actually, he kind of got in the way. Like, look at how he almost crashed the economy in the early 1970s and again in the 1970s. If he hadn't died in 1979, the economy in South Korea might have actually been totally ruined. Okay, so some people say that actually it's very beneficial that he kind of bowed out then, right? They were able to kind of repair the economic damage. So, yeah, I mean, all I can say about that, right, is this is kind of ongoing question. And I think the, the Korean case, it makes for a very interesting example of how to think about this question. Because obviously it was carried out through authoritarianism, right? And we have to be kind of wary uh, whether that's the kind of lesson to take home when we try to learn from South Korean economic development. So, but that's uh, something we're going to talk much more about next week, I think. Hopefully, I hope they can. Yes, Ms. Venus. Hello. 
thank you so much for your lecture today. It's been um, very refreshing. So my question is that given that the democratization in Korea was marked by like significant social movements and public protests, do you can you um, pinpoint like parallels or contrast that you can see between the evolution of democracy in Korea compared to the other nearby Asian countries like Japan or Taiwan? Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, just based on what I know about Japan and Taiwan. Okay. So I'll, I'll answer this question. But today, um, South Korean democracy, at least in South Korea, is is very much kind of celebrated. Um, very much in contrast to places like Japan, Taiwan, Singapore as well. The fact that South Koreans had to, this again, it's going with this kind of struggle narrative, but it's kind of argued that the fact that South Koreans kind of achieved their democracy through struggle has, re has resulted in something much more healthy than what we have in Japan or maybe Taiwan. Okay. The idea here is if you look at Japan, basically they had a constitution written by the United States after the war. And then they implemented this kind of one party system, right? You have the LDP basically been in power except for maybe th three or four years total since 1955. So it's kind of one party system in Japan and Koreans kind of look at the system and they say, look, that's what you get when you get democracy kind of imposed from the outside, right? Whereas since, because we struggled for democracy, we've achieved something where you know, we have this kind of mediation of conflict, something maybe more healthy, maybe even maybe like a real democracy, okay? The Taiwanese case very different because, as I mentioned, um, when the nationalists took control of Taiwan, they imposed martial law and they established a one-party system, okay? Until, um, uh, I believe it was 1988, and then you had the kind of opening of the public sphere, right? And the Nationalist Party, again, survived into the, the post-1988 era. And now what you have today is kind of two-party democracy, basically kind of the Democratic Party, the Nationalist Party. So we didn't really necessarily have the same kind of struggle through the kind of uh, the Cold War era, right? Uh, which which makes it very different from the South Korean case. But um, I don't know if, if like the post-1987, post-1988 Taiwan is, there's there's a lot of similarities with Korea as well. You know, like um, these kind of two-party system basically, and um, maybe you can say there's like a kind of establishment party and then more like a kind of progressive party. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting. How how Taiwan Taiwanese democracy is kind of turning out in comparison to South Korea? I mean, it might be even in a way kind of maybe challenging a bit the South Korean narrative of you know the struggle led to something much more healthy when we see kind of similarities. Uh, but yeah, I would have to know a lot more about the Taiwanese case I think to really explore that further. I mean, if you have any thoughts or comments on this, you know, I would I would be interested to even hear from you as well. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, so we're wondering if like, there's any social economic implications for the recent US elections to South Korea's democratization and political system. Uh, the recent US election, does it have socioeconomic implications for South Korean democracy? That's the question. Does it have any? Um, does are there any social economic implications for the recent U.S. elections on Korea's current political system? I would say. I mean, what we need to look at the most important thing about this election is how the U.S. relationship with North Korea is going to evolve. Right. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, to be honest, I think that's the, the primary kind of cleavage, the primary difference between the, the Democrats in South Korea and the conservatives. Their differing approaches to North Korea is probably the most differentiating 
characteristic between them. And we've seen that the Democrats try to engage with North Korea and the conservatives adopt a more kind of hawkish. And the fact that Donald Trump is kind of Republican, that he has engaged with North Korea has really thrown a kind of wrench into that in South Korea, right? Because the conservatives typically they want they they stay closer to the United States. They really emphasize the 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 strong close US relationship, but the fact that the US then begins engaging with North Korea kind of undermines their own hawkish stance. Right? So it creates a kind of a little bit of chaos to be honest for the conservatives. Um I think that's why we've seen recently the conservatives have begun to talk about nuclearization of South Korea. They're talking about going nuclear. I'm not sure how serious about it. My my kind of skepticism, my skeptical position is that they're playing some kind of nuclear diplomacy, right? Their idea is that they talk about going nuclear and then kind of get some reassurances from the US or um, some kind of benefits from the US. Um, this is the other half of the, the Trump policy, right? So while he's been negotiating with North Korea, he's also been talking about kind of pulling back from South Korea. He keeps saying, you need to pay more. We're getting a bad deal, right? He's very, very fond of this word deal making, right? Um, so he keeps saying that the South Koreans are kind of taking advantage of the US. We need to kind of renegotiate this deal. The South Koreans need to pay more. So in that context, I think the um, this idea about going nuclear um, is is coming up. So, I mean, those are basically the implications, I would say, of the election. I don't know about specific kind of socioeconomic. Uh, maybe if, if you kind of articulate that question a, a bit more, there might be something there. But my main thoughts about the election for Korea, right, is whether this will change the relationship with North Korea and the United States lead to something different and whether it will change the relationship with South Korea, whether the United States is going to pull back, whether South Korea might try to pursue some more kind of independent force, independent of the United States. So that would be my thoughts about the election. I don't know if that really answers your question about socioeconomic implications, but. Um, Ma'am Fana, you have a question again. Yes. <laughs> um, how the, uh, do these two narratives that you talk about address the cultural values of Koreans in mm -hmm. their respective lines? They talk mm. about this. They say, oh, because Koreans are like this, uh, these uh, play a huge role in this in this line or the other. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. there's... I think there's the, the 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 respect to the authority, the respect to the elder. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this has a, a role because in, in terms of the uh, the struggle thing, uh, it's like more ideas, you know, uh, trying to to develop a, like a new way of, of no, I don't know if a new way, but a democratic way to to live together. So mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. cultural values. I think they are very important. So how they explain this? in these two lines. Okay, so where do cultural values fit in to these two narratives, basically? Um, okay, when it comes to the cultural values in South Korea, what we mainly seem to talk about is like Confucianism, right? That, that's usually what's brought up, right? How does Confucianism play a role in South Korea's kind of eco uh, development? And it tends to be much more prominent when we're talking about the economic development. Okay, so this idea that there was some kind, some kind of cultural context in South Korea that created um, a context conducive to economic development, right? It's basically the idea that's analogous to uh, Weber, right? Weber and his idea of the Protestant ethic, Protestant ethic, and capitalism, right? is kind of the Confucian equivalent, right? So this idea became really popular in the 1990s, this idea of Confucian capitalism. There was some um, resonance here with Li Kuan Yu, right? And this idea of Asian values. Um, it kind of lost a lot of momentum after the Asian financial crisis in 1987. So then it began to look like, oh, well, maybe this culture is actually kind of leading to corruption and that kind of thing. 
but it's still it's, it's not gone right it's still there's uh, arguments over whether there's some because we see the economic miracle is kind of outside of Europe and North America kind of mainly concentrated to East Asian countries, right? And then maybe we might be seeing this emergence of a more kind of BRICS, but the jury's still kind of up out on that, right? So there's there's still this very strong argument. When it comes to democracy, though, um, it's, I'd say it's not, not as prominent. There was a little debate in the 1990s, um, specifically about the Asian values. So Lee Kuan Yew was saying, well, democracy is not right. For Asia, right? Because we respect hierarchy. That's so authoritarianism is kind of much more appropriate to our context, right? So Kim Dae Jung actually directly kind of addressed this argument. He wrote an, a response in, I think it was Foreign Affairs, and tried to argue that no, well, actually, we have our own cultural traditions that kind of respect egalitarianism, right? And fairness and uh, that kind of thing. So he said, look, there's just as many cultural. Um, attributes that we can draw into kind of support democracy. And we have our own kind of democratic traditions in, you know, East Asia that we can draw on, right? So he's trying to, he's trying to argue against this Asian values. But in South Korea itself, I don't hear much about this kind of debate, like the, the idea that, you know, conservatives have a certain kind of cultural narrative, progressives, except that I would say that during the 1980s, it's kind of interesting when the students began to come, become radicalized and when they began to kind of become anti-American, pro-North Korean, they did draw a lot on these kind of traditional culture for like they kind of saw themselves as the, the minjung is the kind of keyword here. They were bringing back this, this kind of folk traditions as kind of being like true Korean, but this wasn't necessarily Confucianism. It was like shamanistic shamanism. And um, these kind of um, folk traditions like, you know, um, like totem poles and um, this kind of traditional dancing, hansori, kind of traditional opera. So they were looking more at kind of folk culture and they were drawing it a, a, as a source for their own legitimacy. Like they were they were kind of the representatives of the real Korean nation. And whereas like the, the regime, they were representing, you know, Japanese interests and um uh american interests right they, they were kind of like foreign interests right so there was draw there was kind of a way in which they drew on culture to kind of justify their own student movement um so i don't know if i hopefully you know that kind of gets to your question i mean those are those are just my comments i guess i would say <laughs> What, what role of, culture plays in these narratives uh -huh. in terms of the the the, uh, the struggle narrative uh one uh pattern was that the 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 protest began with intellectuals and students i think i yeah. was, that's why i heard in in all the the, the years that this um you know uh, explode so uh that's very interesting for example okay it's okay different maybe in another countries where uh, i see or, so or, so the world work class or or another kind of group Right. Okay. I understand that. There's also this kind of argument here that maybe Confucianism played a role because there's this idea that the kind of intellect intellectuals have a kind of moral responsibility to kind of guide society and to kind of speak truth to power. There is that kind of Confucian tradition here. There's something called like the, the Sarim and the Jaya. These are, these are terms in, I'm oh, sorry, that should be Jaya in Korean that talk about these intellectuals who kind of lived in the countryside during the Joseon dynasty, and we kind of write their criticisms of the regime, that kind of thing. So there are Confucian traditions here that um, may have something to do with why South Korean society was uh, had this strong intellectual society. Personally, I don't subscribe to that perspective. That's my personal perspective. I think that South Korea was very similar to a lot of places um, with students leading the democracy movements or leading the kind of protest very, we find that in countries like Japan, we find it in Europe, like look at Europe in 1968, for example, these kind of student revolutions, students in the United States during the 1960s and 1970s. I just think that it's, it's, it's more kind of general characteristics. South Korea is more kind of the same than different in this context. Um, so that's my opinion. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Venus has another question. Yes, please. So this is actually connected to what Ms. Carmen has mentioned. So this is more about the generational differences between the Korean citizens. So as we can tell like from the history, the older generations, they usually have like these memories about the struggle for democratization over the de over the decades, while the mm -hmm. younger generations, on the other hand, which I think it's pretty similar to Filipinos and to okay. other Asians, um, mm -hmm. because of the close influence with technological advancements and whatnot, there's a tendency for younger generations to prioritize like other political issues such as um, social justice or climate change. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with these like um, generational divides, do they mm -hmm. exactly affect the voting patterns of Korean citizens or do they um, significantly affect the political stability of the country? Okay, yeah. So a kind of generational divide and how is that kind of manifesting as a conflict in, in contemporary South Korean society? Um, it's, it's important. I would say, I don't know if it's particularly important, you know, compared to other contexts, because we see these generational divides across differing societies, right? Younger people have their own problems, right? Sometimes they're not well represented in the system because it's all kind of establishment, you know, older people, baby boomers, that kind of thing. This generational conflict is very much heavily emphasized in that the movie I mentioned, Ode to My Father, right? It's kind of emphasized in this film, I would say, that basically the kind of problem, the kind of primary problem in South Korean society today is that young people just don't remember the kind of struggle that their, their, their parents and their grandparents went through. And so they don't have the same kind of passion for, you know, um, sacrificing themselves for the nation. OK, so that's kind of presented very clearly in this film. I don't know if that's true. I think um, if you see like these, these the, the protests in South Korean society are ongoing, right? So we, we didn't see an end to protest in 1987, especially since 2003, we've had what's known as the candlelight process. And young people are very involved in these protests. We see them willing to kind of get onto the street and kind of demand for their own interests, for what they think, you know, should be going on in South Korean society. And that to me is, is a sign of they're not being kind of fairly represented. Okay, so they, they feel like they're, the, the political parties are not kind of appealing to them, not really representing their interests. So that would be basically my, you know, interpretation of what's kind of the generational conflict that's going on in South Korea. There is some, some maybe problem of representation, okay? Um, but whether it's, you know, particularly intense or different from other, um, societies, I'm not so sure. Um, what, what would you say about the Philippines in this context? Would you say it's different or, or similar or, uh, uh, could you maybe comment on that? I think it would depend on the, like, where you're at. <laughs> Like for me personally, like since we're students, right, right, um, right, sure. Like a public university, <laughs> we're very like open to the issues of what's happening mm -hmm. currently in mm -hmm. the society. But yeah. I'm not sure if the same could be said with the other universities. So it really depends on. Oh, um, okay. So it's not just generations, right? It's maybe about your education level, or you know, yeah, what university you're going to. Yeah, that's also important. There are, there are other ways of, of thinking about the conflict in society, right? Other than generations. But I think it's very popular narrative in the media, right? The way of kind of communicating what's going on in society. Oh, it's a conflict between young people and old people, right? But sometimes it's much more complex than that, right? It's, it's a way of kind of narrating or conveying the conflict, which is also important to think about, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? For the meantime, Professor, I have a question actually. Um, okay. Did the deferment of the unification during 
Park Chung-hee's time when they tried to focus first on economic development. With that deferment, did that increase the bill or cost for possible unification because they kept kicking the can down the road? So like, right, for example, now these days, uh, South Koreans don't think about unification or don't even want it because, especially the youth, because they know how expensive it will be and how costly it will be. So if, for example, like during the um, during these authoritarian periods, if they had prioritized unification, would unification have been possible and even been cheaper in prep? I think that there's no question. Kind of longer we wait for unification, probably it's going to be higher cost. Okay, and it's going to be more difficult because there's less and less people now who remember a unified Korea. I'm not sure even how many people are left. These these old people who still have family in North Korea, right? The divided families now, they're starting to go extinct, for lack of a better word, right? They're starting to disappear. So that's the longer we wait, the more difficult it's going to be, the higher the costs, I think. Whether we should kind of blame Pak chung for that is another question, right? So if we had kind of prioritized unification in the 1960s, said, enough with this conflict about you know, democracy or capitalism and communism, let's just put the nation first, let's unify, it probably would have unified under the North Korean system. Okay, that's what I think. Up until the 1970s, North Korean economy was doing much better than the South Korean economy. It seemed to have more legitimacy than the South Korean um, because they had this kind of narrative of resistance to Japanese imperialism, resistance to American imperialism, and a kind of emphasis on building an independent country, right? So South Korea, for example, had these American troops stationed on their soil. North Korea didn't have any foreign troops stationed on this their soil. So they had this kind of claim to legitimacy. I think that if South Korea just kind of put aside any ideological differences, probably would have unified under the North Korean system, okay, in, in if they had done it earlier. So for a lot of people, that's just unacceptable, right? They just say like, well, Let's like either defer unification or not have unification at all. So the minute we bring into this question of what kind of unification, it just gets very complicated, right? So the short answer, right, is that yes, definitely the costs are going up. The the um, the it's going to be more difficult, but the implications of that for kind of whether we're you know critical or even celebrating of Pak Chung-hee can go either way. I would say. Does that make sense? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any more questions from the audience? I was thinking about the um, crisis uh, of, uh, I don't know how to say it, the birth, birth crisis, <laughs> new, new yeah. citizens. Uh, mm -hmm. how how is this uh being seen in in the process of the continuity of democracy this is being like a something that they they are thinking about in terms of democracy or or yeah um, no it's being i think it's being treated as a crisis not necessarily in terms of democracy but just in terms of like the nation itself the kind of national power and the economy you know um i think by now in South Korea, democracy is more or less kind of taken for granted as the system, right? There's not really any kind of, to, a, to an extent, to a certain extent. It's what we call, you know, when democracy becomes consolidated, it's kind of the only game in town, right? That kind of thing. I think that's pretty clear by now. But the birth rate is being treated as a crisis. So as many of you know, it's, it's the worst in the world. Okay, so it's the lowest birth rate in the world. It's not just low, it's the lowest of the low. And there's a lot of debate about why this is so, right? Why does South Korea have this such low birth rate? How can we get it up, right? Um, the government is basically throwing money at the problem, right? So they're trying to create benefits. They're trying to, you know, create, um, give social benefits to people who have kids, kind of like baby bonuses, uh, free daycare, um, trying to encourage 
maternity leave. Whether or not that's going to solve the problem, I'm not sure, right? So this is kind of related to when we get into the debates about the legacies. Again, next week, we'll be talking about this rapid economic development. It's led to all these kind of prosperity and all these benefits. But then long term, we have these kind of side effects. And whether in the end, ultimately, in the future, those are going to be more kind of salient or more important, right? It's, it's, it's up for debate. Um, um, yeah, I think that's that's what I would say. It's, it's being, but it's being treated as a serious serious crisis. It's there's there money being thrown at the problem. At the other hand, we might say, well, maybe these kind of deeper social issues are kind of being ignored, right? There might be a deeper problem here. Um, but it's not. I would say it's not necessarily a, like a problem of treated as a problem of democracy. But uh, in your answer, you said something very interesting because uh, it's like democracy is taken for granted, but that's not the case in the rest of the world. It's mm -hmm. the contrary. In many places that uh, are supposed to be democratic countries, mm -hmm. things are changing. And for example, uh, authoritarian ways of seeing life in society are... a. Uh, mm -hmm. Becoming more popular. You're right. Uh, you're right. So, uh, how is that in Korea? This is like take it for granted. Okay. Well, I take it relatively. Okay. Like I don't. I wouldn't say absolutely everyone takes democracy for granted. But I think when we, especially in this context that you mentioned, what we could say globally, there looks to be this kind of move towards right wing authoritarianism. Right. So we have these. Kind of outright dictators would say like places like Russia or maybe uh, uh, Turkey or Hungary, whatever whatever your examples are, right? But it seems like yeah, France, this movement, right? Even France, we have the far right yeah. parties. Italy, the far right parties. Trump as well is is he can even understood in this context, right? This kind of right wing populism, right? In this context, I think South Korea looks relatively good. Okay, so we do have these problems definitely in South Korea, but it's it seems like they're having their their own debates in South Korea. It doesn't seem necessarily connected. We haven't had it like a Trump like figure, I would say. Okay, becoming uh, like emerging in in South Korean politics, we haven't had necessarily these this right wing populism emerge in South Korea. The more cynical interpretation, though, is that the world is kind of catching up. To South Korea more than <laughs> South Korea, like uh, it's like healthy or something. Like South Korea has had this very strong anti-communist discourse. They've had a narrow kind of political discourse because of the rivalry with North Korea, right? So they haven't really need to change to adjust to this context. That might be another interpretation. I'm not really sure, but um, yeah, for the most part, I would say in this context, you know, this kind of global move to the right, I haven't seen any kind of major kind of changes in South Korea in that context. Yeah. Well, Dr. Chung Min De has a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's not really a question, but maybe a very short comment. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, McClay can also share some uh, additional insights because I I found it very interesting when you show the the uh, what's that two two narratives on a modernization and struggles because uh, like uh, you will discuss next week uh, usually outside uh, Korean Peninsula especially in the Philippines uh, when uh, Korean democracy or Korean economic uh, miracle is discussed economy is really focused on so much. So it's like uh, Edsa Revolution in 1986, which mm -hmm. uh, was quite an uh, inspiration for Korean democratic movement, right? So, right. Mm -hmm. but, but mm -hmm. in the contemporary time, it's like a reversed way. Like mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the revolution really happened uh, in the Philippines firsthand, but uh, because of the importance of economic, uh, what do you call the miracle, uh, mm -hmm. Korea achieved. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's really uh, emphasized uh, outside, especially uh, by Filipino scholars and even mm -hmm. uh, the, the regular public. 
And then mm-hmm. I also found it quite interesting because you also said Korean democracy is quite healthier <laughs> because I, I, uh, being from Korea, I found uh, Korean democracy or Korean uh, political uh, uh, movement uh, in the past and present is quite aggressive. But uh, when you mm-hmm. said uh, the democracy that is imposed uh, from outside might be different from what mm-hmm. Korea went through. So mm-hmm. these are what I found quite interesting today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is what I hear within Korea sometimes when they compare themselves to Singapore or Japan and they say, look, we we achieved something here. Japan, the reason why they have this one-party system. So even they'll say like, that's not really democracy in Japan. For Some people will say that, you know. Um, and it sounds to me like your first comment about the, the economic development might be like, um, we look at the Korean case, like, sure, maybe we had this breakthrough in 1987, but the, what has really kind of sustained that breakthrough in the long run, we might actually really have to look at economic development, the importance of economic development. So you compared it with Philippines in 1986, that might have been a different variable there, right? This this basis of economic development. I think that's an important point. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Um, if there are none, uh, Dr. Kim and Dick, can we possibly have an earlier lunch time? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Also, uh, thank you to Dr. Kieran McRae. Thank you, sir, for that very insightful lecture. I felt like I was in master's class once again. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you again next week, sir, yeah. for the next round with the, about more discussions about the Korean economic takeoff. Okay, thank you so much. It was a really great discussion. I was also found it very stimulating and I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So-